our next group um, is um, Ann Goldstein and Joshua Rothman. Ann Goldstein is a translator from Italian. Um, she's probably most well known for her translations of Elena Ferrante, but she's also the translator of uh, Primo Levi, Amara Lacus, and many other writers. And uh, Joshua Rothman is the New Yorker's archive editor and a frequent, frequent contributor to the magazine. Um, and one of the pieces he wrote last year um, for the website was an article called uh, Knausgaard or Ferrante about the differences between the two international literary figure, figures currently dominating US bookshelves um, and the um, difference in readers who preferred one over the other. Um, but uh, so, so we're going to get into that. But I think um, we're actually going to sort of go back into the uh, earlier part of Ferrante's um, American life um, and talk about the book The Days of Abandonment, uh, which came out in 2005. It was the first Ferrante novel to be published here by Europa Editions. And um, I wanted to discuss a particular uh, translation decision that Anne made in the course of a um, passage. Um, and so I think Anne, yeah, would you read the... Is this right? Oh, yeah. This is from the, um, it's sort of the middle of the book where I don't know how many people have read it, but where the protagonist, Olga, is, um, her husband has left her, leaves her in the first sentence of the book. And she's dealing with that with her, one of her children is sick, the dog is, has been poisoned, and she's in a bad way. <laughs> Behind the desk, on my husband's swivel chair, in the gray-blue shadows, sat a woman. She was resting her bare feet on Otto's body. Otto's the dog. Oops. She was greenish in color. She was the abandoned woman of Piazza Mazzini, the poverella, as my mother called her. Sorry. She, smoothed, she smoothed her hair carefully as if she were combing it with her hands and adjusted over her bosom her faded dress, which was too low cut. Her appearance lasted long enough to take away my breath. Then she vanished. A bad sign. I was frightened. I felt that the hours of the hot day were pushing me where I absolutely should not go. If the woman was really in the room, I reflected, I, in consequence, must be a child of eight. Or worse, if that woman was there, a child of eight, who was by now alien to me, she's referring to her daughter, was getting the best of me, who was 38, and was imposing her time, her world. This child was working to remove the ground from beneath my feet and replace it with her own. And it was only the beginning. If I were to help her, if I were to abandon myself, I felt, then that day and the very space of the apartment would be open to many different times, to a crowd of environments and persons and things and selves who simultane simultaneously present would offer real events, dreams, nightmares to the point of creating a labyrinth, a labyrinth so dense that I would never get out of it. I wasn't an innocent. I mustn't allow this. It was necessary not to forget that the woman behind the desk, although a bad sign, was still a sign. Shake yourself, Olga. No woman of flesh and blood had entered whole into my child's head. No woman of flesh and blood could now get out of it whole. The person I had just seen behind Mario's desk was only an effect of the word woman, woman of Piazza Mazzini, the poverella. Great, thank you. Um, so th that's words having an extremely strong effect on, a, on a, um, a person. So I wanted to ask you, Anne, when, why did you decide to leave the word poverella in Italian? How, what was the thinking that? That happened the thinking there. was that I tried many different versions, and I think any other translators from Romance languages will know that um, they have Italian, I, I, I think Spanish also has this quality of being able to add suffixes, which change, which give nuances to words. English doesn't have that nice little ability. <laughs> it's very convenient, you know, a little this, a little that, but it's, there, there are many versions of them, ina, ino, um, eta, um, ella, in this case, Ella. So the main word was povera, a poor, poor woman. And then by adding this Ella, it it's not really doesn't really mean a little poor woman, but it means a kind of poor woman, a poor wretched woman. A it has a sort of nickname quality, and I just felt there was no way to get that in English. So in the first the first place it's mentioned, which is quite near the beginning of the book, I sort of I defined it, and then after that I just left her as the poverella because I felt that that was you know, as, as the book goes on, you sort of get the image of what this word represents. And I, I just felt that it would be so, 
um, it would be cumbersome to find and to, to use more than one word. And I, at least I didn't have the, because it's not, it's, and it's not a fancy word. I mean, it's, it's just a word. It's just sort of a common word. So that was my reasoning, if that makes sense. I think in the, even if you haven't read the Neapolitan novels, I made a similar decision, which I've, people have talked about with the word stradone, which means a big street. Um, again, you know, these, these, these suffixes really have the ability to transform a word that English just doesn't have. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think in this case, it also, she's this sort of, she's the figure that haunts the book from the past. Um, and so leaving it in Italian gives her, at least for me as a reader, it gave her a sort of, I mean, you have different echoes in your head, right? So you hear yeah. sort of Cinderella, you hear something a little fairy tale-ish or a little otherworldly, um, and then it comes to culmination in the scene where she appears in this, uh, in this dire, dire moment. Um, uh, Josh, um, so you've written about Ferrante. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, what was your first encounter with Days of Abandonment, and what was your reaction to it? Well, I think like a lot of people um, who've read Ferrante, you feel like you've discovered like a whole universe, like a whole community, like a whole, a whole world of, of people, a whole social world. Like it doesn't feel just like reading a book, like a novel. It feels like you've uh, discovered a city, um, a community, like a group of people and their ways of being. Um, and actually I think these words like Stradone, Paparella, they have, they're part of that because they create the feeling that you've um, you're reading about places and people who are like the communal property of some actual place or some actual group. Um, and it, so it, it, it is like your world gets bigger. I mean, obviously the stories themselves, the plots and things are really compelling, but a really big part of it is just this texture of reality that you feel like travel, like travel reading almost. Uh -huh. Yeah. Just ask you, did you read this, the Days of Abandonment before you read the? I did. Other I, books? I wanted okay. to dip my toe in the water before okay. I took just the plunge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and I just out of curiosity, does I mean, um, I, is there Neapolitan dialect in the novels, and did you have to deal with that? Or no, that... thank goodness. Okay. There's, okay. Very, there's an occasional word, but but Ferrante usually says when she says um, said in dialect in Italian. She usually then, then um, what the person says is in actual Italian, not in dialect. Mm -hmm. So I think I was lucky that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm, yeah, I'm curious about the ways that, um, you know, these other languages, I mean, Alvaro discusses this in Sudden Death about the way Nahuatl uh, kind of lives underneath Mexican yeah. Spanish. And I, um, I wonder if, Neapolitan dialect sort of lives underneath Ferrante's Italian, um, or if she's yeah. very consciously distanced from it, or well, she. I mean, there's a lot of. I mean, a lot could be said about it, I guess. But um, well, she does. She sort of talks about dialect as the language of um, of the family, the language of home, the language of violence, the language of um, intimacy. So I think, in that sense, um, it it is. It does sort of permeate her Italian. I, I don't know if it's if you could say that it does. This, so linguistically, exactly, but I think it does emotionally in some way. Yeah, yeah great, great. Um, let's see, what else do I have to ask you guys? Uh, what, um, Josh, what do you think about the difference between The Days of Abandonment and the Neapolitan novels? Do you notice, is there a different experience or is it sort of one? Yeah, they're really different. I mean, the, um, well, on the way over here today, I was thinking about the humor theme mm -hmm. and, you know, when, when, when we got invited onto the panel, I thought, "Well, that's a tall order to talk about humor in Elena Ferrante." <laughs> but, but it's true, and the and they are they are like here when when Olga sees this vision of a dead woman from her past, and she thinks a bad sign. That's a bad sign. There, there is a kind of constant um, surprise, which is part of what I mean. It, it is it is a kind of humor. It's like like a humor of twists and turns, and like sudden reversals, and um, and also of of observing yourself and your own feelings as you're having them and thinking about like, is that weird? That's a weird feeling I'm having or, mm -hmm. or is, is it justified and is that the right feeling? There, there is something like it, it's familiar from curb your enthusiasm or something, something where you're, you're <laughs> angry and, but, you're, but you wonder is that, is that legitimate or, or is it um, 
you know, is it is it some kind of trick my mind is playing on me? But anyway, the 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 um, I think the days of abandonment I feel is um, it's more mental. I don't know mm -hmm. if you'd agree to agree no, with this. No, Anne. it is. It's more internal, it right? And yeah. and and the Neapolitan novels are more um, plot oriented and more. It's it's a lot of action and it's about history, and you know, time is passing in those novels, and you're getting a panorama of time, and here you're getting just this period of a person's life, which, you know later could be put in parentheses. Like later this period of life could be said, oh, mm -hmm. that was a period, that was a weird, that was the, that, that time that was strange. And here it's being opened up and you're going into it and you're getting all of the details of how it, how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the amazing things that Anne does um, in The Days of Abandonment is the one, the, one of the voices that sort of comes from the outside in the course of the book is the children's voices. Um, and uh, in fact, at, at a certain point, the main character gives her child a paper cutter or a knife and says, she can tell she's sort of going over the edge and she gives her daughter a knife and she says, poke me when you can see I'm getting distracted. But the children's voices also have this um, very, very convincing, very uh, clear sort of quality that break into this like fever dream of the narrator. And I wondered if that was difficult to do or if the Italian is just very um, plain or... It's, it's pretty plain. I mean, uh -huh. Ferrante is not really a fancy writer or fancy stylist. So I think that um, given that I'm a fairly literal-minded translator, <laughs> it was... Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't... I, you know, you can never say that something is easy, but I mean, I think it was, it was clear what, what, what was required, I guess. Would, it's one way of putting it. Um, I mean, a question I have for you, Anne, is I, when I think about what I love about these books, a lot of it is these um, incredibly exact and perfect descriptions of very extreme feelings. Yeah. Right. And what, and they're amazing. And, yeah. I mean, it's really incredible. And and when I think about like what the first experience is of encountering these books, part of it is you you've just never read someone describe things so perfectly and weird like feelings that another writer would say would put a red mist over your feelings they would just say like you know you're you're you know I was filled with rage or whatever in Ferrante it's exact I mean are, are you aware what what is translating that like if that makes I mean, sense what's the experience of it like or what's the yeah. how do you get the words in or both <laughs> yeah. um well the feeling I mean you know in a certain sense as a translator you're you have to be a little bit detached, or else you would never get the words in. Um, at least, you know, at a certain point. Um, but, but it is hard with Ferrante because she does. Uh, she uses her sentences can be quite long, and um, they're not exactly complex, but they're they're almost run in, run on sentences in English. There's always that danger, and I think that's one of the hardest things about translating her is to make the sentences um, fit into English sentences and and make those emotions. I mean, she does have this ability to in one sentence take you through like a, well, through a stream of, I wouldn't say of different emotions, but like of variations of an emotion until she gets to the point that she wants to get to. Um, and that, you know, it can be hard to manage that in one sentence in English. I mean, again, you know, there are technical different, I mean, the diff some of the differences between the languages um, account for that. For example, in the passage that I read, I noticed that there's this thing about her, her dress being low cut. Whereas in, Ita whereas in Italian, the, the low cut part could be several words away. In, um, in English, it had, to be, it had to be next to it because otherwise you wouldn't know what was low cut. I mean, maybe you'd figure it out, but <laughs> anyway, there's just the sort of technical things like that are sometimes hard to manage. Um, let's see, I think, I think, Brittany, how are we doing for time? Okay, um, I think we're going to move on to the next um, section, but thank you guys so much. That was wonderful. Thank you.